Hi, and welcome to S for Science, and today we're going to see how our neighboring planet Mars can be terraformed. What is terraforming? Well, it is to make a planet suitable for terrestrial life. Each planet is very different from the rest, and this is the reason each one needs a series of very different steps to be able to be terraformed. Let's see what those steps are on Mars. Mars is the fourth planet in the solar system closest to the Sun, and it is approximately at 1.5 astronomical units from it, which means that it is 1.5 times the average distance between the Earth and our star. It is commonly called the red planet due to the large amount of iron oxide on its surface. It is one of the four rocky planets in our solar system, being the most similar to Earth, although its average temperature is about minus 63 degrees Celsius, and its atmospheric pressure is only 0.6% of Earth's. But let's go to the point, what do we have to do to terraform Mars? Well, we could start, for example, with water. This essential substance for life is much more abundant on the planet than most people think. In fact, there is so much water in just the south pole of the planet that if it melted, it could cover the entire surface of the planet under 11 meters of water. And the problem is that it is mostly in the form of ice. For the planet to be habitable, the logical thing would be for this water to be in a liquid state. What should we do for that to happen? To find out, we have to go to thermodynamics. I present to you the phase diagram of water. What this diagram teaches us is the relation between pressure, temperature and the state of matter. Let me explain. We all know that normally water boils at 100 degrees Celsius and it freezes at zero. But the key isn't that normally, because those values are only at the pressure of one atmosphere, that is, the atmospheric pressure that normally exists at sea level on Earth. This diagram predicts, for example, why on the Everest the water boils at 70 degrees, or how pressure cookers work, that what they do is increase the pressure so that liquid water can hold up to a higher temperature, specifically to about 130 degrees, which allows the food to cook faster, reducing the traditional cooking times about four times. Well, the same concept of the pressure cooker can be applied to Mars. If we represent a point on the diagram with the pressure and temperature conditions that we find on the surface of the red planet, the point comes out just below the minimum pressure at which liquid water can exist no matter how hot it is, which is why on Mars the water that exists is solid or liquid. The solution to this problem is in front of you. We just have to modify the parameters so that the point enters the area of liquid water, which is increasing the pressure and temperature. But how do you manage to get water, increase the pressure and increase the temperature? Well, there are many ways to do it, but one of the most interesting is an option that allows you to do all three things at the same time. This is bombarding the poles that in addition to containing water, they contain carbon dioxide. If the carbon dioxide present in the poles in the form of dry ice warmed up only a few degrees, it would sublimate. This would trigger the following events. First, the atmospheric pressure would increase to 0.3 atmospheres, that is to say, 0.3 times the atmospheric pressure that exists at sea level on Earth, which is the same pressure that exists on the top of the Everest. That would allow, for example, for people to not have to use spacesuits due to the lack of pressure. And then, a powerful greenhouse effect would begin to take place due to the fact that there would be more and more CO2, which in turn would increase the temperature, that in turn would melt the poles more, thus initiating a positive feedback process. The process could be set in motion in different ways, such as bombarding the poles with hydrogen bombs or using orbital mirrors to melt the poles. If we chose to bombard the poles with just a nuclear arsenal of Russia and the United States, it would be more than enough. At this point, we already have a planet with liquid water and a significant atmosphere. However, this atmosphere is mainly made of carbon dioxide and water vapor. So, we have another problem. The lack of oxygen. A problem that, fortunately, can be solved with the help of phytoplankton, the source of half the oxygen on Earth. These organisms can convert carbon dioxide into oxygen so they would be ideal as the first colonizers who would gradually make the Martian atmosphere more similar to Earth's. Also, a faster method could be used, the electrolysis, that is, the artificial manufacture of oxygen from water. Here we have to make a parenthesis, because there are a couple of very important nuances, one of them being good and the other bad. The good news is that fluorine compounds could be used to heat the atmosphere, which are on the order of a thousand times more efficient than CO2 as planetary heaters. That would speed up the process, 
The bad news is that even if all the CO2 is released from the poles, the atmospheric pressure would continue being insufficient, since as we have said, it would be at the same as the Everest, where there is no life for this same reason. However, we would be close to having a suitable pressure that could be achieved in two ways, by bringing gases from other celestial bodies, such as comets or moons like Titan, or, and this is the most viable option, generating them from the rocks of the planets, that through simple chemical processes, could release large amounts of gases. And fortunately, it is also important to note that we do not know what is under the surface of the planet. We only have excavated a few centimeters, so there could be huge reservoirs of water and or carbon dioxide that would be more than enough to finish making an atmosphere with enough pressure. You see, terraforming Mars is not as difficult as it seems. As the founder of SpaceX, Elon Musk, said, it would suffice to bombard the poles with a few non-radioactive hydrogen nuclear bombs and finish filling the atmosphere with a couple more gases. Maybe we would need a little more temperature, but unfortunately, we have shown that we are capable of heating planets. And at this point, we already have a planet suitable for life. Except for a small problem. Well, in fact, the biggest one of all the lack of magnetic field. The biggest problem with the colonization of space by humans is neither temperature, nor water, nor energy. It is radiation. The high energy particles that ravage space make it too much of an inhospitable medium for life. And not only that, if a planet does not have a magnetic field, these particles, also called solar winds, end quickly, in most cases, with any possible atmosphere that a planet may have. And this is, in fact, what happened to Mars in the past. It had a dense atmosphere at some point that it lost when the powerful magnetic field that it had disappeared about 4 billion years ago. So the creation of a magnetic field is something essential. Either to protect living beings from radiation or the atmosphere, it's necessary. And creating a magnetic field is somewhat complicated. Mars lost its magnetic field because its core, which is what generated it, cooled. On Earth, the outer core is a still liquid, which means that we have a powerful magnetic field that protects us and the atmosphere from the solar winds. Well, there we have it. We simply have to heat the Martian core, thus reactivating its magnetic field. Well, this would have been a good option if it weren't for the fact that billions of bombs like the SARS would be needed the most powerful bomb that humans have ever detonated. And first, you would have to take those bombs to the core, something that is currently impossible. The pressures and temperatures that you would find would be abysmal, would make it impossible to take them so low. But fortunately, there are more viable options. We can create a magnetic field ourselves. A study carried out in 2008 by the Japanese National Institute, motivated by the possible absence of a magnetic field like the one we could face on Earth in a few decades, due to the fact that it is weakened due to natural causes, it was calculated that we could generate an artificial magnetic field powerful enough to protect us from the solar winds, building 12 parallel cables to the equator that surround a planet with a diameter of only 60 centimeters made of superconductors that would consume the feasible power of a gigawatt, with an intensity of 6.4 megaamps. Obviously, 12 superconducting wires that could go around the world are not precisely something cheap and that could be built overnight. But the thing is that once the atmosphere of Mars is created, we would have several centuries until it disappeared. So we would have plenty of time to extract materials from Mars and build these cables. Also, let's not forget that Mars is much more smaller than the Earth, so it will need fewer resources and less time to build the wires necessary to create an artificial magnetosphere. If we manage to overcome this last step, we would already have a terraformed planet Mars. What today is a cold, desert and hostile world would become a cozy planet, would become the real brother of the Earth. We would have a second blue marble in this solar system. The only thing missing would be filling it with life. We would have a second home, which would greatly reduce our risk of extinction and would kick off the expansion of humans throughout space. And the best of all is that we can do it. We have to overcome certain technological and scientific hurdles, but it has been shown that it is doable. It's just a matter of will. But I'm not talking about the will of a few. I'm talking about the will of all humanity, 
of an entire species, a species that in my opinion has the mission to expand life throughout the universe to save it from extinction. Thank you very much for watching the video and goodbye.